2 Kings chapter 4. And we're reading the first seven verses. And keep your Bible open. And keep your ears open. And keep your heart open. And whisper we prayer to the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me this morning. Speak to me this morning. Second Kings chapter 4. And the verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen or slaves. Let me stop a wee moment there. The greatest attribute that could be paid to any servant of God, and indeed to any child of God, is that they fear the Lord. This man feared the Lord. Now that's not a slavish fear. That's not the fear of a tyrant. That's an awesome fear, a reverent fear of sinning against God. That's what it boils down to. That we love him so much that it grieves us when we sin against him. Do you ever feel that this morning? It's, it's a fear that you might not, that you might, you might sin against God in doing something or saying something or even thinking something. And when it comes to us, boy, I'll tell you if you're walking with the Lord and if the Holy Spirit is filling you and in you, you'll be very careful what you say and what you do and what you think. Because you'll not want to hurt or wound or grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's a fear of God, and it's a lovely fear to have. They that fear the Lord depart from evil. And if we fear the Lord in the way that we should, and this man feared the Lord, and that's some testimony for a wife to give of her husband. He feared the Lord. That's some testimony for a husband. That's some testimony for a minister, pastor, elder, deacon, Sunday school teacher. They feared the Lord. And that one phrase regarding this man tells me nearly everything as a father in this home with two boys. Verse 5. Verse 2, And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. And that was a wee pot, probably the size of an ink pot. And it wouldn't have been oil for cooking, it would have been anointing oil. A pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow these vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, 
And he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt. And live thou and thy children of the rest. And so reads the word of the Lord, and we know that God will bless to us the public reading of his word. When I was in Bible college in 1981, there was a young man, 23 years of age, who sat in front of me in the classroom. He was married with a small family. He left a good job on the call of God to go into the ministry. We were told that he was a very promising and gifted student. We all left on a Friday evening to go home, and before bedtime, he was dead. Suddenly, God called him home. Why? I don't know. How would you know? But I must admit, when I stood around the open grave in Ballyclare Baptist Church at the funeral and saw his two children weeping and his wife sobbing, I began to think and question what I'd been taught for 10 years on the sovereignty of God. How can this be? You see, I had just left a job where this was almost a daily, if not a weekly occurrence. Young men were taken from our side and from their parents and from their children. And I expected it in West Belfast or the West Bank of the Foyle or in Lurgan or South Armagh. It was, as they say, the deal, the part of the job. But here, in a Bible college, on a Bible campus, with a young life given over to serve the Lord with a family dependent on him, I tossed with it. And then when I went to the Scriptures, I dis discovered that the many young men died in the Scriptures. I thought of Abel and Absalom, and Nadab and Abihu, Abner and Uzzah and Stephen, all taken in their youth. And remember you young people here today, you don't have to be old to die. This man that we're after, family that we're after reading about, this man had two young boys probably heading into their teens. He was training for the ministry in the school of the prophets. He was under the scholarship of Elisha, the great prophet of God. And his wife said he loved, he feared the Lord. Now before we develop this this morning, I want to mention something that needs to be mentioned in these days which we live. I want to give you a reason. I'm going to give you a reason why the sovereignty of God and the mystery of God in premature death takes place. Now, having the answer, I don't know. There's a thousand reasons God knows why he cuts a young life off. But I know this. That the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Luke 13. Now hear me this morning. Certain people came to the Lord Jesus in Luke 13. Distressed with the shocking news. That the Galilean Jews were honoring God and worshipping God. And offering sacrifices in the temple. And Pilate sent an assassination squad, and he killed every one of them, and their blood mingled with the sacrifices that they were offering up to God. But come to the Lord Jesus, and they said, as these men, sinners, that this has happened to them? It didn't happen to them because they were sinners. It happened because of sin. But the Lord never turned. Here's what the Lord said. 
And this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons, my friend. Here's what the Lord said. He looked them straight in the face. He says, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So he turned it around to repentance. To repentance. And when you hear of a massacre by the IRA or ISA or anybody else, 9-11 or Oma or Enniskillen or anything else, you remember that God calls you to repentance. And when you think of young lives being taken and people being taken out into eternity and you're not saved, God in His love and in His mercy saying to you, you look at that, you think of that. If that were you, if that were you this morning, for except ye repent, you'll perish. And the Lord used the word perish. It's not me that's using. He used the word, word perish. You see, the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. But the wrath of man can lead to repentance. And 30 years of trouble and bloodshed in this land of ours, many individuals came to repentance through it. But generally speaking, we never, the, the nation, the province never repented. And we're in the trouble that we're in today, but they'll maybe repent before this whole thing's over. Let me tell you, it's not going to get any better soon. There's not a sign of repentance. Oh, yes. In the same verses. Now, listen. In the same verses, on the other side of the coin, Jesus, Jesus said something else. They came to him again, at the same time, and they said, the, the Tower of Siloam has fell, and 18 people have been killed in an accident. Again, he didn't, he didn't say that it was because the foundations were bad. He didn't say it was because the architectural work, work was bad. He didn't say it was because of faulty scaffolding. He said the very same thing, except ye repent, you likewise perish. And when a child is taken from the mother's arms or a man falls off a roof or you hear of a car accident or a plane down or a train down, remember, it's the mercy and the love and the grace of God in that, in that purpose, whatever else is behind, in that saying to you to repent, turn from your sins or you'll perish. Twice he said that in almost the same breath. And that's the Lord speaking. You see, it is appointed on the man wants to die. But after this, the judge. Let me ask you the question, James, before we go on with this this morning. What is your life? Here's a young man, and he died. At least he died trying to serve the Lord. Wouldn't, wouldn't you be better to die trying to serve the Lord than to serving something else? What is your life? Now, it doesn't say what is life because men are trying to work that out from time immemorial. And if I were to ask you this morning what is life, you'd all give me different answers. What is your life? What is your life this morning? Is it money, houses, cars, sport, sex? What is your life this morning? You, you let that individually come into you, the, the Word of God. What is your life this morning? And Robbie Burns tells us, oh, the Scottish poet said, like a snowflake on the river, here today and gone forever. Only one life will soon be passed. Alan Redpath was a, an architect and he had his own big firm before God dealt with him and called him into the ministry. And he tells the story of what, he was at a conference in London and he was going home on the train and the old trains, every time they hit a rail, every time they hit a cross where it was. And he had just heard a message preached on a wasted life. The message that he just after coming from hearing was a sea of soul and wasted life. And every time that train hit those cross went, sea of soul, wasted life. Sea of soul. Wasted life. Save soul. Wasted life. Save soul. Wasted life. Drummed, God drummed it into his heart until he surrendered everything to God and became one of the greatest ministers and authors of the gospel 
that you would get anywhere the day gone by. What about you? Wasted life. Don't waste your life. You'd be better wasted. You'd better be in a Bible college training for the minister and training for the police or training to be a doctor or training to be a nurse. You see the sovereignty of God in this home. You see the mystery of God in this home. But you see the urgency of God in this home. This wife this woman falls at the feet of Elijah the prophet. Now, in the Old Testament, that's the same as just falling at the feet of Christ today. And she came weeping and pouring out her grief. That word cry, she cried, is one of the strongest words that you'll get. You see, it was bad enough she'd lost her husband. And now she's going to lose her two boys because the creditors are at the door and we believe here that they're at the very door. The slave masters are here to whip, to whip them and to scourge them in, in, into bondage where they'll stay for seven years until the year of Jubilee. These two boys brought her to Wits End Corner. Tell me, is your boys bringing you to wet sand corner? Hmm? Are you greatly concerned that the devil will take them into bondage and destroy their lives? It was time that we were crying to God. And one of the lovely things about these prayer meetings is to hear men and women crying to God to release from bondage those in drugs and those in drink and those caught up with all, with all sorts of things. She had nothing left. They were going to take them that day. Oh, some mothers suffer too. God bless them. I suffer far better than some of the men do. Far better. She had nothing left save a wee pot of olive oil. Probably all the rest of the things in the house were gone to try and stay the avenger. Probably the furniture and the bed and everything else. That's, she says there's nothing, I've nothing left. She had done everything she could and why would she not and so would you. She'd done everything that she could to save her boys. But she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. Ah, oh, sure, there your handmaid has nothing. Only a wee pot of oil. Insignificant and valueless and base. Listen, parents, I want to say to you this morning, don't underestimate the wee girl or the wee fella. Don't be getting all uptight now about homeschooling. The Lord will school them. You, 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 you get concerned about their, about, about their salvation. Just leave the education to God. For you mightn't want them going down the road that you have them going down at all. Well, God has plans, you know. You just pray that the Lord will save them and he'll lead them. And don't you be concerned if they don't end up in Oxford or in Queens or in the Royal. God help us. Just you get concerned about their salvation and leave them over to God and God will look after them. So that's what they did whenever Samuel came to look for a king. He came to Jesse, so that them all paraded before them, the big boys and the Smart boys all paraded before. He never thought of David. He thought of him, but he said he's no good. He's valueless. Only a child, only a boy. But David was God's man. And your son could be God's man. And your daughter could be God's woman. And they'll not waste their life here, but maybe if the Lord tarries in some mission field or doing something for God that will be 
that will be worthwhile. Don't despise the day of small things. There's only one hope. And oh, how the Holy Spirit in a few verses is so graphic. There's only one hope to rescue these boys from bondage and from the snare of the devil. But that's what it is. It's the cry to God for their deliverance. And if I come in personal to this church this morning, cry to God like the way Day and Jennifer and the people of this church cried night after night, night after night in that room for Steve. And how Billy and Ruth Neal cried night after day and night after those in these permanent and we all got in behind them for their family and all of them saved. And there's many more inside and outside this church that have come through. You cannot have prayer meetings like we are having without God breaking through. God answers prayer. He's not fooling us. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty and hidden things, that word is, that you know not of. And it's coming, let me tell you, we're going to see great things. And we don't know what has happened from these prayer meetings started in June. We do. We know some things that happened. There's many we don't know. No, we don't need to know either. No, she cried She cried unto God with all her heart, with all her soul. Oh, may God help us to see there's no other hope. Remember Judah when he came, uh, one of the twelve, one of the sons of of Abram when he came, remember when he came back, he, he came back to Jacob or he said to the old Pharaoh, it was, he said to the old Pharaoh, do you remember? When, when they wanted to hold Benjamin down there in Egypt and keep him back, and he, he, couldn't, bring, he couldn't go back to the old father without him. Do you remember, remember he made that cry, how can I go up to my father if the lad be not with me? How can we go into heaven if he not with us? What a picture here. I want to say something. Whatever I'm going to say, whatever I'm going to say now, I have wrestled with this. On three o'clock on Thursday Thursday morning, God give me this word. And I have wrestled with it nearly all night. And anything that I say now, I'm not saying it to hurt, I'm not saying it to wound, And I'm not saying it because we're any better than anybody else, but I'm saying it because I believe that that voice needs to be raised in these days. This home here is a picture of the church today. Barrenness, death, bondage, and fear. The only difference The only difference, there's no big cry to God. A few here and there. And that's so sad. How sad, as the psalmist says, in the pestilence that walketh in darkness and the destruction that wasteth at noonday, we have gone everywhere but to the Lord. The nation's in a frenzy, the leaders are in fear, and the people is in famine. We have put our trust in scientists and in vaccines and in politicians and in the exchequer. We have worshipped the creature rather than the creator. Ministers and pastors and elders leaders have retreated 
in this crisis hour to their bunkers and to their basements and to Zoom where they're singing stand up, stand up from Jesus for Jesus and they're hiding. They're regurgitating an old 10 minute message and if they don't, they're not one of their own, it's one of somebody else. They're regurgitating an old 10 minute message on the Lord's Shepherd to try to comfort the people. And all hell breaking around us. Now I know I'll not be popular for this. I'm not worried. Do they not care? And I'm saying this out of a sore heart this morning. Do they not care that many of their people have got sick of it? Pensioners are sitting in car parks at two below zero with rugs around them. And massive big churches, millions and millions of pounds spent on them where they could isolate 200 people in them and pray. With a lot of pray. Heating with your money. The only scripture that comes to my mind and came to my mind at four o'clock the other morning was Matthew 24 and 24. If possible, in the last days, the devil and the enemy will deceive the very elect. And I can hear some boy go, oh, but that's for the Jews. Everything's for the Jews that you don't like. Did you ever hear that? It's for, this is for the Jews. Oh, it's not for, no, it's for you, boy. You have to give an accountability. You deceive the very elect. God help us with what is wrong with our land. Do they not know that some people are traveling miles and miles to get into a service to worship God? But I can tell them that there's teenagers sitting in prayer meetings here for two and a half hours and never move. And as long as they come, we will provide for them. And I say to you this morning out there, you say what you like about me for you're saying plenty about me. I say to you this morning, open your churches before it's too late. And don't be surprised if you don't that they'll not come back to you. Now cut the corn and starve you out. This is supposed to be the greatest crisis that we have from World War II. Tell me this. What would Wesley and Whitfield and Luther and Calvin and all those men do in a crisis? Do you think they'd be hiding? Those men that burned on the stake and those covenanters that the blood shed around Scotland. Do you think they'd have been hiding? Oh, we'll speak about the covenanters and we'll speak about the martyrs and we'll say how great men they are. And some pestilence comes along and we run with fear from it. God help us. God help us. Whenever the early church went out to preach, 99, there was 99% of a, of a chance, if you want to call it a chance, 99% of a chance that they would be killed, that they would be, that they would be crucified, that they would be burnt at the stake. 99% of a chance that 1% of survive. Let me turn the coin over and say to you this, there's 1% of the population of Britain have died with COVID. One percent. And we're duking. And we're hiding and we're running. There's something big behind all this, let me tell you. And it's control. It's control. And Theresa May, for whatever goods in her, she said in the House of Commons, and I heard her saying it, she says we're closing the churches for good reasons to keep people safe. 
But she says there's going to come a day when there'll come in a government that will close the churches for the wrong reasons. And if they get the thin end of the wedge, they will. We've had the police here four times, five times over there this morning. I told them we're getting sick of this now. We're getting sick of it. The greatest crisis since World War II. And there's not a church hardly hope in our country. God help us. God help us. The battle was well and truly on for this weeping widow. She poured out her heart at the feet of Elisha. She says, oh Lord, death, poverty, bondage. She doesn't go to the neighbor to cry on the neighbor's shoulders. She doesn't go to the king and she doesn't go to the politicians. And she doesn't go to the witches, and because the land was rife with witches, and uh, just after Jezebel, just Jezebel, whole old spirit of Jezebel was still there. She didn't go to the witches. She went to God. You take your problem to God. Be running around the neighbors talking about. Take it to the God. She doesn't turn on God and challenge him and chastise him. Why you take my husband? Why are you taking my son? What sort of a God are you? She doesn't go around complaining to the pastor or the minister or anybody else. Jesus never answered her question. He asked her a question. (laughs) He says, what have you in your house? Hold tight now. Let me hold that a wee minute. What is in your house? Tell me, would there be something in your house that would need to go? Mm -hmm. Could there be something in your house that's hindering the blessing in your life and in your family? It would be good if we went round and seen whatever's in our homes and do what they did in Ephesus, take them out and have a bonfire. What have you in your house that shouldn't be there? Hmm? Maybe books. Maybe magazines, maybe DVDs, CDs, shouldn't be there. Give them back. If you have something that doesn't belong to you, give it back. I wasn't going to say this, I'm going to say it as we come down to a close. You know, Pat and I lived in every county in Northern Ireland but County Down. And every time we moved house in the garage, I came across three things. Three things that are still. And I'm saved now. I'm 10 years saved and God's calling me out into the work. Every time that I moved house, I came across these three things. A GT badge that came out of... Kent Plastics, for I worked for a wee while, a GT badge, lovely wee badge, it sat down in the hollow of the steering wheel at an old rally car with no exhaust on it, and it sat down in, in, in the hollow of the steering wheel. It was the loveliest wee thing you ever seen. And then I had a big Jaguar badge, you know, them big, big leopard things, them big long silver things of the Jaguar, one of them. And they had a massy, two Massey Ferguson badges, one three five and the one seven five. And I had the three of them and I stole them out of Kent Plastics and I kept them for ten years after I was saved. And every time I moved house, God says them is not yours. And you need to give them back. 
He says, I've called you now out into the work. And I was going round, <laughs> I was going, going around dealing with boys for doing the same. He says, you'll have to give them back. You'll not destroy them, you'll give them back. You'll bring them back. And whole structure down there had changed, but I had to bring them back. And I had to say I stole this. Your handmaid has nothing. Thy friends are a good place to stay. Thy handmaid. <laughs> I'm nothing. I am nobody. And I have nothing. You see the sovereignty and the mystery and the urgency and the poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And God, God said to you through the man of God, go to the neighbor and borrow. Go to all your neighbors. Now get this right. Read the text right. Go to all your neighbors and gather all the empty vessels that you can get. Not a few. And if you want another head and to rhyme with that, it's foolery. What foolery? It's not empty vessels this woman wants is full vessels. What vessels she wants? Listen, it's not verses she needs either. We're all good at throwing verses. And it's not versions she needs either. She needs somebody to help her. And it's not vaccines she needs either. What this woman needs, she needs victory over this. She needs victory. This is this 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 is the devil. This is death. There's two words that she does not want to hear. And one is borrow. And the other is empty. For she's had her fill of both. For they've done nothing but borrow. Empty. Friend, let me say this morning as I come down to a close, we need to empty ourselves of all our old stinking pride and preconceived ideas and notions that have been hammered into us from children. We need to be empty from rebellion and fear and lust and greed and cast ourselves at the feet of the mighty sovereign God who who, when we do, will come in power amongst us. It's not until we're running on empty that can we expect to be filled, nor do we want to be filled. Gather them up. Go on and gather them up and gather all you can get. Go to all the neighbors round about. Bring them in. And they gathered all the vessels whether they gathered all that they should have or not, I don't know, but they gathered all the vessels that they could and they brought them into the wee house and shut the door. And when you go into your wee house and you shut your door and you go down before God, your heavenly Father that seeth in secret will reward you openly. No big glamour here. No big testimonies here. No big singing here. I declare, do you know, we had come to this place and only God pulled the reins this cover. We had come to a place where the church is turning into a showmanship. And if you can get a boy without a leg or without an eye and without an arm and you get him up, you'll fill the place on a Sunday night. But it's not working. It hasn't worked. Well, you, you bring people in under the Word of God and bring them in to pray and bring them in and give them, a, give them a, an hour's preaching on holiness and sanctification and 
filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll not, you'll not fill it. You'll have a few faithful. There's no showmanship here, no spectatorship here, no gimmicks here, no advertisement here, just God. No TBN stuff, no, no, no God channel stuff. No pleading for money here. We never sent a collection plate ever from the day we come round the people in this church. We have a box at the door. We never mentioned money. And you never heard us. And this place is paid for completely and utterly long ago. No pleading for money. Pleading for money to keep, keep, we need money to keep us on the air. Ravenhill used to say they need money to keep them in the air in their private jets. God has been waltzed out of the church. And he's left it to our own devices and this is the way it has turned out. And when the Holy Ghost comes, we'll not need these things. Now, there's a new breed of people now being introduced to the church since lockdown, to the gospel magicians, if you don't mind. And when I heard that, I thought there's enough clowns without any more. Gospel magicians. Is it any wonder God's grieved? Is it any wonder the Spirit's quenched? And is it any wonder that the Spirit is vexed? And we read in the Word of God that the Spirit was vexed, the holy dove of God, the gentle dove of God was vexed, that he turned against them to fight. Imagine that. The dove doesn't fight. She shoes and she runs. And every one of us are to blame and we need to examine our hearts and I tell you the pulpit needs to examine and I do. And I have asked God to forgive me for things. Lastly, there's the dependency. By faith, she committed her need the whole thing lock, stock, and bar. She shut the door. She brought them in. She got the wee pot. The wee pot. She lined up all the vessels. So they've been all sizes, you know. God's people are all different. There've been different designs on them. They're in different shapes. Everybody in the house wouldn't have the same thing. She lined them all up. And she got the wee pot with a wee drop of anointing oil in the bottom of it. And she began to pour. And she was, before she had the first one filled, she was dumbstruck. And then she went to the next one. Went to the next one. Nobody looking on now. No sightseers. No music. On and on and on. I don't know how many, many of these boys brought in, but she says, bring another vessel. One of the fellows says, we have no more. I declare to you this morning with the God of heaven that we have, if they could have got the vessels and kept them coming, she'd have been pouring to now. There is no restriction with my God. Heaven opened. Should have been poor and yet. But the oil stayed for it. There's nowhere to go. And the Holy Spirit needs somewhere to go. It needs someone to live in. And if you reject them, you're going to be the worst off for it. If you reject the filling of the Holy I'm not asking you you're saved. I'm asking you you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You can be saved without being filled with the Holy Ghost. I was 10 years. The greatest need of the hour is men and women to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It 
It wasn't until the moment that she was prepared to let go what she had that the miracle began. Friend, listen, we can sing all we like. I surrender all. But do we? If our vessel's not clean and the vessel's not empty and the vessel's not available, if you're not clean, if we're not empty, if we're not available, there'll be no blessing in you, in your house or in the house of God. As the vessel kept coming, the boys kept bringing, as the woman kept pouring, kept pouring, the oil kept flowing. And here we are as we close the sovereignty, the mystery, the foolery, the dependency, and the plenty. Plenty. The only problem was there was nowhere to put it. Oh, praise God. May the, may, may the Spirit, may the oil keep flowing through these prayer meetings. May the oil of the Holy Ghost keep flowing until the people are standing in the car park crying to God and all the critics will be silenced. God has come as he promised. An hour or so before this, she says, I'm empty. Now she says, I'm plenty. An hour or so before this, she says, I'm in poverty. Now she's in prosperity. An hour before this, or so before this, she says, I'm in bondage. And now she's in blessing. An hour before this, she was crying. And now she's laughing. Here's the point I hit as it closed. She didn't say, Amen, Lord. And say, Billy, this is for you here. You sell that and you, you go and buy yourself a car. Johnny, this, this is for you, Johnny. You go and do whatever you want now with that. That's your money. And I'll put a wee bit of this, sell it and put a wee bit by for a nest egg. For the, these nest eggs, you see, for children are great. Satisfy the conscience, you see. We, well, that's for the child, that's for the young, for us. Not a bit of it, some of it's for yourself. She didn't, she didn't say, and I'll keep this here, and, and I'll, I'll pay me debt with this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get this, and I'll get the furniture back. I'll buy my suite back, and I'll get all the things back that I lost, and far more. No, she didn't do that. You know what she did? She went back to the man of God. And she says, what am I going to do with this? Do you ever ask him that? You ever ask him what you're going to do with what's in the building society or in the stocks and shares or in your property? Do you ever ask him, Lord, if you're coming back soon and we're near the end, and what would you have me to do with this? What would you have me to do? You need to go to God and ask him now what you're going to do with it. You need to pay your debt to God as well. Pay it to man. I was preaching down and I'll not say where because you might know the people for they were prominent businessmen about 20 years ago. And we're sitting around a cup of tea and one of these men, and you'd probably know his name, he's in big, big business. He's belonged to this church. Good, solid man. And we're talking about different things around the tea table, around the cup of tea. And we're talking about praying for missionaries. He says, it's an expensive job to pray for missionaries. I says, why is that? Well, he says, I was on my knees the other day and was praying for a missionary couple that were in great need. The Lord said to me, stop praying and get up. 
you can meet their need and far more than that. He says, I had to get the checkbook out and write a check and tell you, he says, expensive work. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, that I'll not pour out thy spirit upon you. And there'll not be room to hold it. Like the wee, pa- wee jars or the vessels in the house. May we be empty vessels and may we be filled. May God bless you and bless his word today.